My name is Josh. I own Mass Hardscapes out of Holliston, Massachusetts. We specialize in outdoor living and I am a hardscaper. Welcome to the I Am A Hardscaper series on the How To Hardscape podcast where we sit down and interview a hardscape business owner and do a deep dive on how they became a hardscaper and how they operate their business. We would like to thank our sponsor, Jobber, for sponsoring this episode. They have something very special to share with the community, so stay tuned to that announcement later in this episode. And without further ado, here's our interview with Josh of Mass Hardscapes at Mass underscore Hardscaper on Instagram. All right, Josh, let's get to know a little bit more about yourself and how you got started in this industry. Can you give our our audience uh, some background context about yourself and your business? Yeah, so I kind of have a, a, a kind of long story, or at least I, it seems to be a long story. So I um, I just grew up kind of around landscaping. My parents always were very meticulous landscapers, did all their their own landscaping, it, um, all the houses we, we lived in as we grew up. Um, and so I just kind of grew up around it. And um, I didn't really realize that I liked it until I was in high school. I had a job at a farm. And one of the owner's kids owned a landscape company. So I started kind of doing some landscaping with him um, on the side. And then I ended up starting my own landscape business. Um, I was probably, yeah, 16, 17, like when I first got my license and did that until about college. Um, And then when I was doing my college search, I was kind of in between construction management had always wanted to do construction like building houses and then at some point I really don't know when this changed but at some point I was like I'm gonna actually look into landscape degrees um don't know where that came from but I just decided hey like I'm gonna start looking into it um so looked at a a bunch of colleges for that and then just ended up at uh, the University of New Hampshire for landscape operations um so my idea going into that program was i'm going to own like a general landscape company so i'm going to do maintenance snow construction irrigation you know everything like a lot of companies do i want it to be big um you know have 30 40 guys that was kind of my my dream my goal and as i went through college i realized my passion wasn't really for the more of the green side of the industry. I didn't really care about the maintenance stuff, um, the horticulture stuff. Um, I learned all of it, but I just didn't really get excited about it. And I actually had um, my hardscaping courses with Bill Gardaki, um, who I'm assuming you know, for anybody who doesn't know that is Dirt Ninja's dad. So Bill has been a long time writer in Hardscape Magazine, ICPI, NCMA instructor, super well-known guy in our industry. Um, So I was lucky enough to have him as a professor at school and he really got me um, just diving into the hardscape part of the industry and got me really excited about that. And I just found that is really what I wanted to do. Um, So when I graduated, college i worked for another company for i think about three years doing sales work running a hardscape crew um it was a company that did landscaping and hardscaping and so that was just um it just helped me figure out what i wanted to do and as we did the landscaping i was like man i really don't want to do this forever um so i just you know saved up my money and did a bunch of planning and budgeting and after a few years i i went out on my own and started my business um so now I'm in, this will be my fifth full year um, and it's, it's gone super well. So um, that was kind of the, the reader's digest version, but. For sure. I, I've got some questions based on what you just talked about there. I, we've had a, a mix of guys come on the show that have that educational background in the industry and started their business to guys that, uh, you know, just started from the family business or has just started a business themselves. So I want to get into the educational aspects from, from your side of things. Do you believe that education that you went and got uh, really set you up for success for starting a business? Or would you say that the, uh, you know, your experience working for that company for that that small amount of period set you up a little bit more for that? Or was it like two different aspects, the theoretical and the the in practice? What what can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And I I actually always like to talk about this because as somebody who went to school, I really don't believe that you need to go to school to do well. Um, I think more what I got from my education was connections. Um, The degree itself, there was good parts of it. I definitely learned there, but um, because it was a horticulture degree, I don't use a lot of what 
I learned at school. Um, so I think the connections were more what set me up for success. Um, so I think really what I paid was just to, to meet people and get um, connected in the industry. Um, so I think you, you probably learn more from doing the work. And I know I'm a, I learn from doing things. And like a lot of guys in our industry, they don't learn by sitting in a classroom. Um, so I think there's, there's more potential to learn from somebody. The key is finding somebody who knows what they're doing and is um, willing to teach you and share their knowledge, which that can be the hard part in our industry is finding somebody who does things right and is willing to share that information. Because um, there's a lot of companies out there that don't do things right. And you may go work there with no knowledge and be like, oh, they seem great. The work comes out good, but they may be installing incorrectly or something like that. Um, so I think just really for me, I think most people's success, if they have a good mentor, that will set them up the best. And that's what I found with myself. I don't think I'd be where I am if it weren't for the help of other people. Would you say if there's somebody listening to this that wants to get in this industry, would you tell them uh, you know, maybe they don't know quite yet where their passion lies. Would you tell them, hey, try school out for a year and see the connections that you make and, and the path that you go on? Or would you say, go work for a company for a year and then kind of make your decision from there, whether you want to go to school first or you want to, uh, you know, start your own business from there? I would honestly say a combination of both is ideal. Um, you know, like what I was doing is I was working summers while I was at college. Um, and so that kind of gave me the practical experience as well as, um, you know, being at school. So I would say probably a combination of the both um, is probably best, but it depends on the program too. Um, if you're looking at um, an expensive school, like my school, I went to UNH, which is a very expensive state college probably not worth it to go spend, you know, 40, 50 grand just for a year. But if you have a good um, technical community college or something like that, that probably would, would be a lot smarter of a decision. Um, so I think it's kind of based on people's situations. And, um, but I would say ideally a combination of the both would probably be the, the best. So then getting into where you start your business, where does that fit in the timeline when you, you know, got out of school and you started working for another company, where, where do you take that leap of faith to start your own business? And was it always your intention to start that business? Yes. I, I had wanted to own my own business since I was probably 10 years old. I didn't know it was going to be like a hardscape business. Thought it was going to be more construction. Um, but I had always had that dream. And when I started going to school, that was my plan and my employer knew that. So the employer that I worked for after college was the same one that I worked for during college. Um, so I started there just kind of as a laborer and then worked, just worked my way up until I graduated. And then I started doing some more sales stuff and running um, an installation crew. So I had basically just been like, I'm going to gather as much knowledge as I can, save as much money as I can, try to buy um, a lot of the smaller tools, the things that I can afford to do now um, ahead of time. And I actually started my company probably two or three years before I officially went out on my own. So I was able to start doing some side work under that name, um, which can be a little tricky when you're working for somebody else. Um, luckily, I had an employer who I was very close with and who was getting towards the end of his career. So it wasn't the end of the world for him. But I tried to just get get a little bit of work going. So I had a portfolio. So when I went out on my own full time, I had some work to show for it. So it's kind of just finding the right balance of, all right, I'm in a good financial decision. I feel like I have the knowledge. Um, and then once you have those two things, just going for it, you know, it's definitely not something you want to jump out on when you have zero money saved or invested, or you just aren't ready in terms of running the business. So, um, and sometimes that takes kind of having a mentor who can kind of say, Hey, I think you're at that point. So, right. Yeah. And it, th that's a great position to find yourself in where you can do these side jobs. I myself was in the same position, not working for a contractor, but a supplier that I was able to work on the side. So my next question is with that side work, like what kind of jobs were you doing with that side work? And then when you jumped off and, and actually went full time into your business, what kind of jobs were you doing then? Like, did it differ? Did you, when you, you know, made that leap of faith, did you specifically look for a certain type of job 
uh, because now you're doing these in- incredible, you know, backyard spaces. Were you always trying to focus in on that or did that just come in time with a progression? Yeah, kind of both. So my, that was my hope. I was always into the bigger spaces and more custom spaces. Um, but it was a progression too. So when I started doing side work, I was doing work for like family and family friends, stuff like that. So it was like walkways, basic patios, small retaining walls, things like that. When I started my business, um, I mean, at that point, I was like, I'm going to take whatever work I can get because I'm just starting out. And I don't know what happened, but my first year, I just got a lot of, I mean, we jumped right into outdoor living. Um, maybe not to a crazy large scale, um, but definitely bigger jobs than I ever thought I would get in my first year. I mean, I can remember two of our jobs from that spring um, were over $30,000. And that was like crazy to me at that time. Um, And I think those first couple of jobs are actually the ones that set me up to just keep growing from there. So by the end of my first year, we had two jobs that I think were over 75 grand, um, which is, I mean, now it doesn't seem those aren't too crazy. I mean, they're good sized jobs, but back then that was just crazy to me. So I think I just realized over time that I enjoyed doing the larger scale projects more, um, but I had to progress to get there because you can't just jump into those projects, nor do you want to. Um, And I like to say this as an advice piece to, to younger guys, as cool as they look, those are the ones that you can lose your shirt on if you don't know what you're doing. So you kind of need to work your way up to that. Um, but be, once I found out that's what I wanted to do, I pretty much only advertise those types of jobs. And I tell people that all the time, like advertise for the type of work you want. So we'll do small projects every year. We'll get some walkway jobs, some basic patios, but I, those are, aren't on my website. Um, really try not to po- post them even on social media. And that helps the work come in. That's the type of work we want to do. Yeah, that's smart. And speaking of which, let's get into leads. Where are they coming from in your business right now? Uh, as opposed to when you were first starting out and doing side jobs, where are they coming in right now that you see the most traction in terms of whether that's paid advertisement, whether that's online, offline, where do you find that your leads are coming from the most right now? Now we are mostly word of mouth. Um, we've, we've been very lucky to have clients that just keep sharing with their friends. Like there's so many jobs I can think of large jobs that are like, Hey, my friend, you did work for, they gave us your name. Um, and I honestly have one customer from my first year in business who has made this massive web of customers for me, just crazy. Um, but I would say most of our work is word of mouth. Um, I do very, very little paid advertising at this point. And it seems like every year I do a little bit less of that. Um, last year I did a little bit of Facebook ads. Um, I think that was pretty much it. Um, which has been great because referral work is pretty much guaranteed too. Um, so that's been really good, but it's been a progression like everything it's been. When I started, I did like newspaper ads and magazines and stuff like that. And um, every year I've kind of played around with different things, but just found that word of mouth is, is most of our work as well as organically through my website. So one of the things One of the reasons I named my company Mass Hardscapes is I knew it would be good for marketing. So I get a lot of just organic flow through our website because of my name. Because if you Google Hardscapes in basically any town in Massachusetts, we will be one of the first ones to come up. Um, I was on the phone with a buddy the other day who's down in Bridgewater, Mass. And he said, when you Google Hardscapes in Bridgewater, my company comes up before him. And that's an area that we don't even service. so I got a lot of organic stuff through through my website, um, which is great too, and not having to pay for that. So um, yeah, lots of just organic and word of mouth is basically um, where most of our work comes from at this point. Gotcha. And then when you were first starting out, whether that was side jobs or when you just first started your company, uh, I mean, going full time into your company, where were those leads coming from? Was that, uh, were you getting some based on your your employer who just didn't want projects? Were they coming? Did you have a strategy in terms of how to get these jobs lined up before you took that leap into going full time into your business? Um, yeah. So I started doing some advertising like the fall before I start. So I started in the spring. I started advertising in the fall, trying to get some work lined up for the spring. Um, 
and that was literally I did some some local town magazine newspaper kind of things um and then I remember I actually did door hangers um so I walked around to a bunch of neighborhoods and just put door hangers on on people's doors and that is actually how that customer I was talking about before who's just created this huge web of customers for me I I just came across this little neighborhood, um, four houses, but they're all brand new, very nice houses, put door hangers on. And I was driving home. I like literally had had left that house probably 10, 15 minutes earlier. And the person, one person contacted me from that neighborhood and was like, hey, we've actually been thinking about doing an outdoor space. Like just saw your door hanger, want to talk. And we started talking and that was in the fall and got that project planned. So come springtime, we were we were ready to go. Um, so yeah, a lot of it was just the local newspapers and then that, and then honestly that one customer, I got probably a handful of jobs just in that first year after we completed their project. And then each year that that web is just, grown which is just crazy to think about from from one customer so yeah i like i like that you mentioned you know you you have a a target project that you're going for and you only include those pictures on your website those pictures on because that's the specific job you're going for but you're you're you know not afraid to pick up that that sidewalk job or the you know those smaller projects where where do you, does it make sense to pick up those smaller projects for you? Does it is it to fill time in between jobs? Is it to is it only if the numbers make sense that you pick up these projects? Like, where where is your cutoff? Do you have a set minimum amount that you'll go for for projects? And how do you figure that out? Um, I wouldn't say we have a set minimum. I mean, sometimes I'll look at jobs that are just so small that I just say to a customer, "We're just not set up for this." Um, and I, I know so many contractors around that I have a great referral base, so I can just send them to somebody else, which has been great. Um, but I find that the smaller jobs, yeah, they're good for filling in. Um, sometimes it's nice to have a, a break too. Um, so if we've been on a job for a month, it's nice to just go do a job that takes a day or two and just kind of get in and get out. Um, but I don't think we can be because of the way we're set up, we're not as competitive on those jobs. So um we're not always getting those because a lot of customers are just looking for a walkway or a basic patio or looking at multiple contractors so, and usually we're on the high side so it's fairly rare we get stuff like that but when we do it's just kind of a nice yeah just fill in um you know we finish a job on a wednesday and we just need a day or two to finish the week great we can throw in a little job I want to take a short break from today's episode to thank our sponsor, Jobber. Now, Jobber is giving back to the community. I'm really excited to share this opportunity with you and everyone listening to this. I'm excited to share Boost by Jobber, Jobber's new $100,000 grant program, which is built to help launch, grow, and strengthen small home service businesses. Whether you're an almost entrepreneur, new business owner, or an experienced business owner, you are invited to apply for grants ranging from $1,000 to $20,000. And in August 2021, Jobber will be announcing 20 recipients and will be following along with the winners' stories. Seeing how the funding has impacted their business, whether you're seeking new equipment, marketing dollars, whatever it might be, your reasons for applying are going to be personal and unique to your business. And Jobber knows that business owners are very busy. So the application is only two questions long with an optional video. And I urge you to do that optional video if you have the time. You can go to boostbyjobber.com. It takes five minutes minutes to fill out this application and personally I want to see somebody from this community win this so that I can also follow up with them see how they're doing with it and how it has impacted their business so please go apply for this if it's something that you're interested in and reach out to me to let me know that you did apply for it and if you're listening to this after May 5th, I'd still encourage you to check out Jobber software. Jobber builds award-winning job tracking and customer management software for home service businesses. Thank you, Jobber, for sponsoring today's episode. Gotcha. So let's get into once a lead contacts you, where does it go from there? So whether they call, email, whatever it might be, how do you know that that customer that's calling you, emailing you, texting you, whatever it might be, is, is a customer that you would be willing to work with? What questions are you asking them? What kind of process do you have in place to, to ensure that before you set up that initial consultation, that they might be a good fit for you? Yeah. So, so most of our work, it comes to our website. I actually, and this is very different. I don't post my phone number um, really anywhere. I try not to give my phone number out to customers until they actually are in the sales process. 
Um, so I like to just go through email. It keeps me more organized. I can keep track of everything. So customers usually are contacting me through email or through the website, which just sends me an email. Um, and the first thing I do is once they contact me through the website, they have to check off what type of work they're looking for. So I'll have a list of check boxes that will have like patio work, fire pit, fireplace, outdoor kitchen, pool patio, stuff like that. So immediately I'm getting an idea of the type of project when they first contact me um, before even talking to them. Um, once I get that email, I will usually the first thing I ask is where they're from, because we're in an area where um, I live on kind of the line of there's some money and there's a lot of money. So depending on what, what town that is coming from, like there's towns where if they contact me, I know they have money. Like it's just an automatic, they have money. So that's a good start. Um, I will try to get a little bit more details on what the project is. If they have an idea on, on design, um, if they've done research on products, on costs, um, just try to get an idea of where they're at in the process. Sometimes I will send people to another contractor if I feel like they're just not a good fit, the project's too far, anything like that. But usually I'll end up setting up an in-person appointment and that's really where I can get a better feel for things. I try not to ask about budget until we're in person. Um, so usually at the in-person appointment is where I can get a, a really good feel for where that, that person is at. Um, and if I don't get a good feel, I'll kind of end things there and say, hey, this just isn't a good fit. Contact this person. Um, that way I'm not spending too much time. Um, I don't want to go through the whole design process with somebody and then find out that we're doing a hundred thousand dollar design and their budget's 40 grand. Um, so try to get a feel for that beforehand. Gotcha. So then that, um, that initial consultation, first off, do you charge for that and why or why not? So indirectly, yes. Um, I don't charge directly because everybody does free consultations. Um, so basically what I do is I say we do free consultations, but I'm working that time into my overhead. So I'm, it's being charged more so to my customers. Um, so it's being recouped in our hourly rate. So it's just basically being put in as overhead. So we're getting, I'm getting return on that, but I also don't have to directly charge, which is great because it makes it look free to customers. Uh, but once we get to the de design phase, I do start to charge depending on what type of design is necessary for the project. So if a customer needs a basic 2D design, which I do for basically any job anyways, to figure out quantities and have plans for my guys, it's free. But once we start getting into renderings and 3D design and fly throughs and stuff, then I, I charge. And usually I give them a range for that. And it's just based on an hourly design rate. Gotcha. That's smart with the uh, knowing your overhead expenses and indirectly kind of charging that uh, initial consultation. So when you're there meeting with the customer, what kind of questions are you going through to know what's going to be incorporated in that design? And, and uh, yeah, so what are you going through with them to ensure that you're incorporating the right features and the right design for that customer? So I'd say, I'm trying to think right now, I, there's some main questions I will ask. So um, talking about products is always a big conversation and it's kind of a hard one to dive into on initial meetings, but I like to, I don't like to be dropping samples off at customers' houses um, after the fact. So I try to get um, products nailed down in that initial meeting. So products is always a big thing, figuring out um, their style, whether they like more of the contemporary crisp lines, um, you know, smooth finishes, colors, things like that. So I can get an idea for that. Um, I always ask customers whether they like curved shapes um, or they like square or a combination. Um, Cause then I can play with that. If somebody's like, we like square, great, super easy. Um, if you don't ask that question, you put a design together and then they say, hey, we don't like square, then you're just starting from scratch. Um, so that's a big one I always ask. I ask what the space is gonna be used for to get an idea of how big it needs to be. So if a customer says, we just want a place to put our grill and a dining table and a fire pit area, great. I can say, all right, we need two almost designated spaces, maybe a few hundred square feet each. Um, where if they're like, we want a spot around our pool for a fire pit, we want a big dining area, we want an outdoor kitchen area, we want a place for a pavilion, 
um, you know, lounge chairs. Okay, now you're going to need at least, you know, 1,200 square feet plus. So then that can give me a feel for, for how big of an area it needs to be, um, what spaces they need um, based on what they're going to use it for. Are they entertainers or is it just going to be them and their family? Because um, those things can really change the size of a project. Um, and then budget is kind of one that I try to get to. If somebody has a rough budget, I can say, hey, we can't get to a thousand square feet. And it sounds like from your wants, you're going to need about a thousand square foot space, but your budget is only allowing for us to go to 600 square feet. Um, and that can, can give me a sense of, of size and scale too. Um, and then as far as features go, I, I will basically ask a customer like, you know, it kind of goes along with what are you going to use the space for? So if they're like, we want to sit by a fire with family and friends, great. We know that you want a fire feature. Are you looking at a fire pit? You're looking at a fireplace. Do you want it to be gas, wood burning? Here are the benefits um, to each thing. Um, same with like kitchens and, and just everything. It's kind of just figuring out what the uses of the space are going to be and, and what their their hope and image is for for the space. Yeah, and getting into the designs, you mentioned you'll do 2D designs because it's just incorporated into the project and you'll do 3D designs for a charge. So how do you differentiate those customers that just want the 2D versus the 3D? Is it maybe they need a bit more visualization of the project and then you'll offer that, hey, we do actually do 3D designs, this is the package. How does that kind of incorporate in there? In there? I will basically lay out what our options are at every meeting, unless I go to a walkway and clearly we're not going to do a 3D rendering for a walkway. But if, if I'm at any project that there's a range in, in the project size and, and elements, I'll say to a customer, here's what we can do. We can start with a, just a basic 2D design. For some people, that's enough. They, they're good at visualizing things and they can just look at a 2D design and they're good to go. Some people are so visual that they need a 3D design, even if it's a somewhat basic space. Um, so that's why I just like to lay it out to people and say, here are our options. I'll give you a 2D design. And if you find that that's not enough, it's really easy for me to just make that into a 3D design. Um, so that kind of gives people the option. When we start getting into the larger projects, I basically tell customers like you need to be doing this. This is a very large investment and you want to make sure that you're getting exactly what you want. Um, usually telling people what the the renderings will do and basically saying i can put you in your this future space customers just want to see it they just want to see their backyard before it happens so usually for somebody to spend you know three four five hundred bucks on a design is really nothing when they're spending fifty hundred thousand dollars um so kind of just lay it out and make it open-ended for customers and kind of let them choose the route that we go. Gotcha. And then when it comes to presenting the design, do you like to try to meet with the customer? Obviously, this year has been a, a, a weird year, but do you usually try to meet with the customer to present them that design? Do you kind of email it over? What does that presentation look like as well as the payment terms? Once they're ready to go, what does your payment schedule kind of look like for a project? I would say it depends on the scale of the project. So if we're if we're getting in, if we're just doing a 2D design, I'm probably just going to email it to them. I'm going to put dimensions on it, give them the total square footage, things like that. That's usually enough. If it's a kind of more basic rendering, kind of the same thing. I can send them snapshots. I can send them a fly through video just through email. Um, and what I do is I make sure that I get the design payment before they get the design so basically what i'm trying to do is make sure that i just cover my time doing the design if they decide to go work with some other contractor at least my time was covered there um, if it's a very large scale project usually the design process is pretty long it's not like oh i do a design and it's perfect and we're good to go so i'll usually go meet with a customer i may send them things ahead of time so they can look it over but chances are we're going to send up another meeting where i we can sit down go through individual spaces in the design in the actual program, um, see what needs to be tweaked, what's good, and go from there. So every every job's a little bit different, but I'd say there's, there's usually kind of those three different scenarios. Um, and as far as payment goes, um, I just talked about the, the design payment goes, but as far as job projects, um, it, I do my payments depending on the job costs. So if it's a smaller job, basically under 20 grand, we have 
two to three payments. And if it's anything over that, we can break it up in three, four, five payments. Generally, it's going to be three payments. Um, this year, because we're so busy, I've been taking small deposits just to hold people's positions. Um, so projects that normally were three payments have actually been four. So basically adding an extra payment. Um, and usually for our most of our jobs, it's, it's three payments. So they'll pay a third, two to three weeks before the project starts, another third about halfway through and the final third once the project is done and we've done a walkthrough. I want to ask you if you, in, in your time operating a business, owning a business, uh, has there been a time that is kind of a horror story that you've had? And it could be around payments, it could be around dealing with customers or even inst installation on site. Do you have a horror story that you'd want to share with our audience? Uh, this is something I, I kind of like to talk about because this can be encouraging for other people. I have had, there is one, like we can call it a horror story that I have had since I started my business and that is it. Um, I can confidently say that we've made money on every job that we've ever done. Um, there's never been a struggling through a project being like, oh, I didn't think about this. Maybe with small things, nothing ever big. I'm a big planner. Um, I love to have things fully planned out. And they say every hour you spend in the office saves four hours on site. So I try to take a lot of that time beforehand so that when we get to a job site, everything is planned out. Um, so luckily, there's never been anything crazy in terms of, um, you know, when it comes to actually on a job, which is great. And it's not because I'm any amazing person. I just have done the right things. And everybody can do that, which is just cool because anybody listening just you know if you're doing the right things you can make it through without major issues so the one story i do have was just a customer that was just um very difficult it was in my first year in business and it was one of those ones where they seemed very normal and easy to work with when we were going through the sales project or process and then once we started the project started to get a little wacky um Long story short, we did a good sized patio with the sitting wall and fire pit, water feature in the backyard and the front yard. We did a new walkway and some granite stairs and made it through the backyard. Everything was great. Got to the front yard. We were just doing a running bond walkway. And so it was a four or five foot wide walkway and flared out. So it curved in and then flared out to the steps. And so there's many ways to do your running bond walkways when you get out to a flare like that. You can run it, keep running it in the same direction. You can have a curve, flare out, and have your bonds coming in. So we ended up doing that last option. The customer was there that day that we installed that part of the project. They okayed everything. We finished the whole project. And I have just been trying for probably like a week to get this final payment from the guy. I was like, I'll come by, I'll walk through the project, make sure you're good. And long story short, the guy's like, you guys did it wrong. You didn't do a good job. I'm not paying you. And so we set up an appointment for me to come by and talk with him. And I actually, I didn't tell him I was doing this, but I actually had my techo rep. It was a techo job. Had my techo rep meet me out there, um, basically to back me up and say that we did things properly. So the guy's saying, oh, you guys did a crappy job, blah, blah, blah. So I show up with my techo rep and his whole just everything changes. He's like, oh, you didn't do a bad job. We just didn't like the way you did it. And I'm like, well, you were there the day that we we did this part. Like I remember him being out on the steps with his wife, okaying that part. And I'm always very transparent with customers. Like, hey, we're at this part. There's many ways to do it. Which way do you think will look best? So it was 100% cleared by this customer. And um, so long story short, I actually ended up calling Bill Gardaki and being like, hey, what am I supposed to do here? Like, we did a really good job. It came out great. Customer just doesn't like the way we did it. And he said, you need to just stand firm, like take them to court if you have to, because he owes you money. It was a good chunk of money. And uh, me being the nice guy I am, unfortunately, sometimes um, I kind of met him in the middle. I gave him a price to redo that section of the walkway. And we kind of met in the middle um, cost wise. And I said, you know, I'll meet you halfway and I'm not making any money on this. Like this is literally just covering us being here and we kind of fixed it up and things were good from there, but it was an interesting scenario. Um, I had never dealt with something like that. So luckily I had people who I could get 
advice from as far as what to do with that, but it, it worked out, but it's, it's just with, with human beings where we're all weird, everybody has their things. Sometimes you can't tell. So I try to look for those things and customers when we're going through the sales process, like, Hey, are they going to be a difficult customer? And this guy, you just could not tell. Um, so just get to that point where it's like, all right, I'm all right, I'm so far in. I just have to deal. Like I can't walk away from this. I have to just deal with it. So, um, but other than that, things have gone pretty smooth. You know, we've had our minor things on jobs or with customers, but nothing ever to that extent, which has been good. Yeah. And I like asking that question because it does help our audience to understand if they're getting into business, you know, these things will come up and it helps them to kind of think of things that they can put in place to prevent that from happening to them. Because we all have those horror stories. We all have those dealing with customer stories uh, from that specific story did you put anything in place to prevent that in the future whether it's uh you know a written change order with everything like that or even pre-planning those minor uh you know design uh aspects of a job do you have anything in place now to kind of prevent that that you can help our audience visualize that a bit more yeah yeah so that was actually something i was just going to bring up um over time, you figure out like in your contract what needs to be added. Um, when you first start out, if you even have a contract, it's probably gonna be pretty minimal what is in that contract. Over time, you figure out, hey, I need to cover myself from this and this and this. And there's a lot of things. It just adds up over time. You're always, it's like every year, you're probably adding another thing. Um, so adding print in your contract that somehow covers you in that situation definitely is necessary. Um, because of the design program that I'm using now, I was using SketchUp at that time and I wasn't super great at it. So it was, I wasn't able to, to map out a project exactly in terms of like the pattern and everything. And now with the program I'm using, I can do that. So I will design a project and lay it out exactly how it's gonna be like. So when a customer sees that, that 2D plan view design, like that is what they're gonna get. And if they want to change anything on site, yes, we have a change order form that they fill out to make sure that we're covered from that. Um, unless it's, if we have it in writing, like customer text, will say, hey, can we, we were going to do the fire pit area to 45 and we wanted to just be at, you know, parallel with the rest of the patio. Can we do that? Great. At least it's in writing. Um, but if, if it's more of an on-site thing, like, yeah, have them fill out some sort of change order that just makes it clear that the customer wants that they're okay with it and then you're covered and then josh getting into the installation side of things um any anything that you guys really stand behind in terms of the installation on-site practices that you'd want to highlight here uh, on this podcast my biggest thing because this was pounded in my head when i was at school by bill is compaction. Um, and it's something that I actually, I get a little heated about um, just because of some things that are going on in our industry as far as compaction goes, especially with open graded stone. Um, compaction, I think is the biggest, the most important thing when it comes to the longevity of the systems that we're installing. Obviously like proper excavation and base depths are gonna be important in drainage, but proper compaction really is gonna prevent most of your problems from happening. Um, so I think having the right compaction equipment is such a big thing. And I'll say right now, if you're installing hardscapes and you are able to pull your compactor out of your truck with two guys by hand, you are not compacting to the right capacity that you should be. And that isn't a hundred percent true. I know there's guys out there who will do, who has have machines like that and every inch they're compacting and that's great but you're just not efficient doing that. Um, so buying the biggest compaction equipment that you can afford and are able to move to, depending on what your equipment setup is, um, that is such an important thing. Um, and that will allow you to have a longer warranty and just be confident in your work. Um, and so when it comes to open graded, there's um, some people in the industry that have kind of pushed this, you don't have to compact open graded stone. It's 99% compacted when you dump it out of a truck and that's honestly just the biggest lie um yes it doesn't need as much compaction as like a dense grade gravel um but it still needs it so that's just something that gets me fired up because i don't know why companies are pushing that because there's no benefit 
um, to them from telling people that. Um, but open grade still needs to be compacted. And it's one of those things you don't need massive compaction equipment, um, but it still needs to happen. So um, a lot of the demos people will do is they put in a five gallon bucket and put it on top of a compactor and let it run. And they say, all right, it didn't consolidate. Well, that's because you're in a hard five gallon bucket. There's, I mean, in, in an actual install, you're gonna have the, the soil below, you're gonna have the soil on the edges that you're gonna pack into. And you're also running over the top. You're gonna get some, not consolidation, but you're gonna, um, it's gonna move things so they interlock differently, um, which is a little different than gravel, which will actually consolidate. Um, so that, that's something that I get pretty, um, into as far as the, the installation process, I'm a big, um, proponent of open graded, but some people just don't like it and that's okay. Cause there's still other right ways to do it, but going the open graded route is like another big thing for us. And we've been doing for, I think this actually will be my fourth year doing that. So we kind of got in when it was just first starting, it wasn't like a big thing yet but it was kind of starting. Um, I only knew of a few other people who were doing it. And then it seemed like kind of the year after we started, it really started to take off, not because of us, um, but it was just becoming a thing. So um, I would say those are kind of my, my biggest things when it comes to installation and, and just making a project that lasts. Yeah, definitely. And uh, by the time this episode airs, we had the guys from Dufferin uh, Aggregates on to talk about that specifically. They said that the three quarter inch clear is somewhere around like 85 percent compacted when it's laid out. So you do absolutely need that additional compaction, as you said. And and I've heard that before, that it's 97 percent compacted, right? As soon as it's laid out or 99 percent. It's just uh, something that we do need to kind of get more information out there that it definitely needs that compaction. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that too. Cause there's a lot of studies on it and there's varying numbers, but I would say like when I do my estimating for projects, I will figure probably about 10% to just cover myself in terms of quantity of stone where like when we were doing dense gray gravel, you have to figure more like 30% or so for compaction. Um, so I would say, yeah, that 10% number is, is probably pretty close. Um, so I'm glad to hear, hear them saying that. And, and there's all sorts of numbers too with the percents is from what I learned, open grade stone, you can't really get to 100 or near that 95 is actually your max. Um, so I'd say, yeah, 85 out of a truck probably is where you're at and where dense grade, you can actually get to 98%. Um, but when it's dumped out of truck gravel is probably very low. I mean, it compacts 30 something percent. So. Yeah, absolutely. And what about equipment tools on site that you live by? Uh, whether that's a, you know, a small tool or a big piece of equipment that you guys uh, stand by with your business and are happy to have it on every site. Oh, I can go on tools forever. Honestly, a lot of the pave tool tools are just game changers. Um, Pave Tool just makes some crazy awesome products. They're literally their goal and everything they make is to make you more efficient and make your life easier. So we've we've adapted a lot of their products that have just made us more efficient and made our lives easier. I'd say out of all their things, um, my favorite like smaller tool would be like their screeder kit. Um, so you got guys who are dumping their sand or their chipstone. They're taking a two by four level on their hands and knees and screening that way. So their screeder kit um, has three different blade sizes. It hooks up to extendable handles. So you're standing up and dragging your stone, which just makes your life so much easier. Um, it's a little bit quicker. I'd say that's my favorite. Like that's a must have smaller tool. Um, as far as bigger stuff goes, I, I would say that like our excavator is the, the most used bigger piece of equipment that we have. I know there's so many guys um, who are getting like mini, um, the mini track machine kind of things like the ride on ones. And um, so many people are like, Hey, should I buy that first or an excavator or a skid steer? And I could never imagine buying one of those ever, to be honest, never mind as a first piece of equipment, but we use our excavator on every single job and for so many things, whether it be lifting and setting stairs or pavers. I mean, we are using it for excavating, for grading out lawns, like literally everything. So our excavator, um, which we actually have a tilt bucket on, it's no NCON or tilt rotator, but, but it gives us some 
um, play, which is huge. So I would say our excavator with our with a tilt bucket has been, I mean, such an incredible tool. And I could that was the first big thing that I bought when I started my business. I bought a brand new excavator because I knew I would use it on every single job. Um, so I would say as far as the bigger stuff, an excavator is 100% my favorite tool. And then as we come down to a close here, Josh, I just got two more questions for you. But they're uh, they're good ones here. Uh, beginning with anybody that you, uh, you know, look to in the industry for inspiration, whether that's online, offline, mentors that you've had that you want to give a, a shout out here. Uh, anybody that you follow that you want to highlight here, uh, I'll just leave it up to you to, to take that away. Same thing. I could list stuff forever. As far as people who have been super influ influential in my life and have been like my mentors, as far as me and my career go, um, my former employer was was great, um, allowing me to, to get so much knowledge and, and honestly make I made a lot of my mistakes um, working for him that so I didn't make them when I started my own business. Um, so if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here. Um, Bill Gardaki is, I would say, the biggest influencer in my life um as far as his work goes um he's been there to answer all my questions and and push me and um has got me involved in so much as far as the industry goes and, and look, meeting other people um and actually through him i met phil baylor who owns pave tool who has um also been a great great um person to go to with questions somebody who just loves the industry and, and loves to help people and answer questions um so phil has been an incredible person to be connected to too um so i'd say there without those three people i would not be doing what i'm doing now um as far as just people that i follow that i enjoy watching um there's obviously some big ones out there that are awesome i mean andy mudler from and then SNWI, whatever. Everyone makes a joke about that. I think I actually might have got that right. So Andy is a great dude. Um, I think his they just do awesome work. He runs an incredible business, uh, the way they're set up. Um, they run debt free, which is just so awesome to hear. Um, and I think he's just genuinely a good, good guy. And unlike a lot of people, he isn't, I don't think he's getting sucked into the social media world and um, you know, taking on all these free products and, you know, stuff like that. I think he's somebody that you can trust and just has great information. Um, Garrett from Premier Landscape Rhode Island. Um, he's a really good friend of mine. I've met through social media and he, his company does awesome work and he's a really genuine guy. And um, they have, I would say one of the nicest fleets as far as people I know. He's just, he's got a brand new Pete 10 wheeler. He's got a brand new, I think like 75 excavator with an NCON and just like, he's got all the stuff. Um, he's always buying something. So he's a, he's a great guy. And um, probably the company that I look up to the most in terms of work um, would be Dragonfly Ponds and Patios or Dragonfly Outdoor Living. So he is a guy, his name is Tim and he's local to me. We do work in a lot of the same areas and he just does, they do what we do, but on a larger scale. So they're always doing just huge outdoor living spaces, always with pools, super high end stuff. Um, and they just do some of the most incredible work. And he has, he just has so few followers on Instagram and deserves like to be followed by so many people, just, just quality work. He doesn't care about, um, you know, the social media stuff. I just, I think he's just so focused on doing good work. And you can see that when, when you look at their work and, um, I think he's actually has projects in the Unilock and Teco catalogs. So they just do some pretty crazy stuff. So I'd say those are kind of like the guys that I just automatically think of. Um, and, and Tom Gardaki, the Dirt Ninja, has been a really good friend of mine through his dad. And Tom is a very, um, obviously more excavation based, um, kind of not so involved in our industry anymore, but just a, a great person to to get information from too. And as we close down here, my final question to you is obviously you've learned a lot since starting your business, but I want to, I want you to choose that one thing that you know now that you wish you knew from the very start. So through everything that you've learned, what's that one thing, you know, now that you wish you knew from the very beginning? Mm. Oh, that is very hard. I'm not sure if there's something specific to myself that I can think of, but there's a lot of things that I always try to 
tell newer guys that I just know or things they need to hear. Um, and I think one of the most important things for younger guys starting out to hear is to not be so worried about what everybody else around you is doing. It's hard in a world of social media to see other people and be like, wow, they are doing this and they have this and like, why is it so perfect for them and easy? Um, so I think it's, it's important to remember that social media is not really real. Um, like these companies who post crazy stuff have worked years to get to that place. Um, and they have their own struggles. And so you need to kind of just focus on yourself and, um, you know, work hard and you will be at that same point one day. Um, you can't have the biggest and best of everything right away. It takes work. So just reminding yourself of that. And, um, yeah, just not worrying about your competition. Like people are so worried about like, oh, I know this company charges this, so I can't charge anymore. Like it, you need to just know your numbers. And if you know your numbers and that you need to charge, charge a certain amount of money, like don't, don't sway from that because you are running a business to make money and you need to just focus on yourself and take care of yourself and your employees. And um, so just, yeah, not worrying about other people, I think is such a um, important thing to remember, especially for, for newer people. Uh, excellent. Excellent advice, Josh. Thank you so much for joining us here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This is uh, great. It's always fun to be able to just talk to people about our industry. Josh, where, where can our audience learn more about everything that you've got going on? Where do you want to send them to? Um, I feel like I'm just always coming up with a new thing. Um, Instagram is, is my biggest, um, place where I'm the most active. So my tag, um, is just her handle, whatever it is, just at mass underscore hardscaper. Um, so that's where I post most of my stuff. Um, as far as people who are kind of looking to talk to me, like need some information, I'm actually starting to do a little bit of business consulting too, specifically with newer businesses. Um, they can actually email me too at um, josh at hardscapeconsulting.com too. So if anybody has very specific questions or um, really just genuinely needs help with things in their business, they can email me there. Um, it's easier for me to give good responses and keep track compared to like Instagram or stuff like that. So, and then I am on YouTube. That's kind of how I started. I haven't really done too much with it, but it's the same. It's mass hardscaper on YouTube. I got some, some videos on there. So some time lapses of jobs we've done a little bit of some kind of behind the scenes stuff on jobs, as well as some, um, kind of like informative videos, like on estimating and things like that. So. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Josh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode with Josh of Mass Hardscapes. Go follow him at Mass underscore Hardscaper on Instagram. Check out all his social channels there as well as YouTube. We are looking forward to seeing more from Josh this year in 2021. And thank you for listening to today's episode. Reach out to us on our social channels. We are at How to Hardscape on Facebook and Instagram. Send us a message and definitely go check out Boost by Jobber. Go check out that grant program that we talked about earlier in this episode. I'd love to see somebody be awarded this in our community so I can follow up with them, see how it's impacted their business. So go to boostbyjobber.com to apply for one of these grants. And we look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.